So when I became dean in 2015, I thought, I've been a professor for a long time. I've been a department chair. I've been an associate dean. Uh, you know, I ran our EMBA program in China for a couple of years, and I don't know how to be a dean. If you want to drastically improve your business, learn proven growth strategies, and generate sustained results for your organization, you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Innovation Junkies Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Innovation Junkies Podcast. My name's Jeff Standridge. Hey, this is Jeff Emmerich. Glad to be back for another episode. How you doing, man? Yeah, pretty good. No complaints. Kind of uh, iffy weather out there today. So as it was yesterday. Typical stormy day in in spring in Arkansas, right? Yeah, we we had some flooding in downtown Conway night before last. A couple of tornadoes, but you know, I, I slept pretty well through it. <laughs> Enough water to kayak down the streets, or no? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could have absolutely done that. Jeff got a great guest with us today, Matthew Waller, Dean of the Sam M. Walton College of Business at the University of Arkansas, uh, where he not only serves as Dean, uh, Dean Walter also serves as the leadership chair and professor of supply chain management. Uh, in addition to all the work he's done in academia, Matt serves on the board of the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute, co-founder of Bentonville Associates Ventures and Mercari Technologies. He's co-author of a number of books, including uh, purple on the ad, how J.B. Hunt Transport set itself apart in a field of brown cows. And his most recent book, The Dean's List, Leading a Modern Business School. Uh, Matt, great to have you with us today. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. How's the weather in your in your neck of the woods right now? It is cloudy and um, spring clean and warm, but it's supposed to get cold, colder all day, all day long. I think it's going to get down to the 40s, but it's also windy. So I'm, I'm looking forward to going for a nice stroll outside. <laughs> One of the things we like <laughs> yeah, to do is, is, is talk about kind of a, a random musing as part of the podcast. And so a good way to kick it off is, is at Dean Waller, what was your most memorable stormy day? <clears throat> My most memorable stormy day was um, back in about, I think it was probably 1998 or 97. I don't remember exactly, but we, um, we'd lived in Northwest Arkansas for <clears throat> a few years. We moved here in 1994. And uh, the weather looked kind of bad. It was a Saturday. And we had, um, I guess it, it must have been 1998, because we had three kids at home. One was a, a baby. And, um, and I noticed these big black clouds that looked really unusual um, on the horizon. But I had a lot of yard work to do that day. And I was out working in the yard. And I realized I need to go to Lowe's and get some some things and so i went to walmart and then i went to lowe's and um when i was getting in my car the wind picked up really strong um i opened my car door and i thought it was about to rip the door off i come from kansas city missouri and um back then i was in platte county um kind of a rural area I say Kansas City, but it was actually not in the city limits. But we had we used to have lots of tornadoes. They don't they don't have as many as we used to have uh, up in Platte County. But I remember every summer, you know, we'd be in the basement a uh, couple to the summer because of tornado warnings. And um, back then, they didn't send you to the basement until you know they'd spotted a tornado on the ground. You know, because they didn't have the the capabilities, the Doppler radar and all. So at any rate, um, that picture went in my mind. I've seen lots of destruction from, from um, NATOs. And, and I didn't have a cell phone. 
right? But I wanted to tell Suzanne, we didn't have a basement. We don't have basements here. Uh, but I hurried home, and uh, by the time I got home, it wasn't it wasn't too bad. You know, it was like there was damage. There were you know limbs down in our yard and things like that. But uh, but it scared me because I just pictured our kids up in their beds taking naps, and a tornado <laughs> hitting. So that's my most memorable one. Wow. Jeff, what about you? Um, you know, I, my most memorable storm, I have several, but they're generally most memorable day after days after the storm, you know, I've spent a number of years as a paramedic and, and so, you know, there were a couple of times we had to go out in the storm and someone who had been injured in the storm, most of them were, uh, were day after. And I, I, it was, it was actually 2014 and I wasn't, I'd years away from being in the medical field. I was still, I was at Axiom at the time and I got up and saw the image in Valonia on, on TV. Um, and so I just drove out there and they had the roads blocked and, and told the guy, look, uh, former medic, former, they were calling for anybody to come and help that had any experience at all. And so he would just wave me through and I went on in and joined a team and we went, went house to house, just kind of looking for folks that we could help. And it, it was, it was most memorable because of just the sheer devastation. I mean, it's just unbelievable how giant virgin, uh, uh, oak trees were twisted off mid shaft and, and just amazing kind of the, the fury of a storm like that. So that was probably 2014. <clears throat> how about you, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, I was as I was listening to, to you guys think there were there, there there are two incidents that I can think of, but one is maybe a little more recency, about maybe more than fifteen years ago, maybe longer. It may have been uh around two thousand four. I I uh, used to ride long distance uh bike rides quite a bit. And the very first one I did that was cross state was from the Colorado border to the Missouri border in Kansas. And on the second day of it, we were, it was a Southern route on the second day of being out on our road bikes, we see, we saw this spectacular supercell out in front of us on the road, probably about five miles ahead. And it turns out it was an EF4 tornado <laughs> mm. that went right across the road. And we got to witness all that about four miles ahead of us. You could see the cloud on the ground. We could see. It was wrapped. Um, so that's pretty spectacular. Talk about being exposed. Four knuckleheads out on bikes on a road with no cover anywhere in uh, southwestern Kansas and a tornado across the road. Now, thankfully, we were fine. And it, it you know, tore up some wheat fields and whatnot out there, but didn't hurt anybody. But th when we dr rode through that spot later that day, see the, where the tornado had kind of plowed through. And it was about a quarter mile wide across the road with trees and telephone poles and things down. So that was, that was probably mm -hmm. the most memorable near miss with a, a large tornado. Well, hopefully we'll have, um, we won't have any of those today, even though the drastic weather changes and, and what have you, you know, it's uh, I got up the other morning, Saturday morning, my daughter and I went to breakfast. She was here visiting and it was 34 with a heavy frost. And by the end of the day, it was 72. <laughs> <laughs> Typical I mean, spring weather in the Ozark. Yeah, yeah. Top into the podcast. So Matt, with at Innovation Junkies, uh, what we do in on the consulting side of the house is we focus on, of course, innovation. But I, we like to talk a lot about, and and we find ourselves working with clients a lot in the areas of leadership, uh, organizational effectiveness, culture, and strategy certainly as how they re relate to innovation and how they relate to the, the effectiveness of an organization in executing against their plan. So let's talk a little bit about the, the organization you lead, the, the Walton College of Business, and maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the culture of that organization and, and your perspective on relationship and culture and strategy. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure to be with you too. Um, you know, I would say, when you talk about strategy and and um, culture, you know there's the famous uh, quote by Peter Drudge: uh, "Culture eats strategy breakfast every day," something along those lines. Um, 
And I tend to believe that. Um, so one of the things that um, we, um, back in uh, the, the late 90s, we um, came up with our values as a college. And, um, you know, values are a key part of culture. Mm -hmm. If they really are the values. And so, uh, so the values we came up with, and again, values have to do not so much with um, what you want to be, but what you long for, what you, um, uh, what you um, think would be good for your organization to believe or to have. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we, we came up with excellence, professional, innovation, and collegiality as our four um, values. Again, this was back in the late 90s. And, um, you know, the, uh, the values, the acronym is EPIC, Excellence, Professionalism, Innovation, Collegiality. Back then, the, phrase, the term EPIC meant a long heroic story or poem and um you know today of course uh, epic has other meanings including great and so that just happened over time but uh back when i became dean back in uh 2015 we made a big effort to verify that those really are our values and not figuring out um are we good at these things, but do we want to achieve these things, excellence, professionalism, innovation, and collegiality? So one of my associate deans, Annalie Kelly, did an empirical study of the college, which included interviews and um, a survey, and we confirmed that, yes, those still are our values. And um, and so then, and, and Jeff, and Jeff, you've been in our buildings here, Mm -hmm. uh, all three of our buildings, you see Epic uh, everywhere. Um, it's on our elevator. It's um, it's on our hats. Uh, it's on all kinds of things, and we talk about it. In fact, when um, department chairs or unit heads come to me for resources, I always bring up our our values and say, "How does this fit with our values?" I also say, "How does it fit with our mission and uh, vision as well?" Um, and, you know, it's funny, uh, it felt awkward to me. Um, I think it does for anyone. When you first start really trying to embed values, to talk about them so much in so many different contexts. So, you know, um, for example, the vision of the Walton College uh, is that for teaching research and service to be thought leaders and catalysts for transforming lives. Um, so I would bring that up a lot. You know, how does what we're talking about doing affect our vision, our mission, and our values? Mm -hmm. And um, that really, I think, starts to um, embed uh, the idea of the of the culture from the values. So, so how do you go about um, assuming that your culture? evolves but but hopefully it stays relatively uh stable right that's that's kind of what our hope is that our culture is who we are um how do you see the intersection or the uh inner workings of, of developing strategy on a annual basis three year basis every five years or what how, how does that relate to culture from your perspective in 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 your institution or an organization um let me let me um before I tie it to strategy, let me tie it to the vision and mission. So as I mentioned, right. the the vision of the Walton College is to be a thought leader and a catalyst for transforming lives. And I like to say we are catalysts for transforming lives through thought leadership. But the question that is open in our catalysts for transforming lives into what? Right. And mm -hmm. so the answer to that is into business people who hold the values of excellence, professionalism, 
and ocean and collegiality. So I challenged the marketing and communications team back in, I think it was 2015 or 16. Um, I gave them a tough challenge. I, uh, I said, we need a tagline for the Walton College that ties together our vision and our values. Again, trying to make values the definition of our culture because, you know, mm -hmm. culture is about shared beliefs and, and values. And so um, I showed them a video uh, from the mid 90s um, of Steve Jobs unveiling the Think Different um, uh, campaign. And by the way, uh, for those listening, if you've never seen it, if you Google um, Steve Jobs Think Different campaign, like on YouTube or Google, there's a video of him unveiling it. Jeff, Jeff, I don't know. Have you all seen this? Absolutely. Video? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have. It's been a while, but yeah. It, it's, it's really wonderful. Uh, but I showed it to him, and I said, could you all come up with something like this? And they really impressed me uh, with what they came up with. And they, they came up with Be Epic, right? So our values are represented by the acronym EPIC. And they came up with the Be Epic campaign. I don't know if you can see that, but um, mm -hmm. it's uh, part of our uh, values and our vision. So it ties the two together. And we so, um, so let me let me let me let me up. So you know, one of the key points of a tagline and is does it stick, right? And so when you mentioned that you that you uh, uh, gave the, the charge of coming with a tagline, I wrote down on my notepad here, be epic. <laughs> Oh, um, it's, it's stuck with me, certainly. Yeah, it, 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 it really did. Um, it, so we created all kinds of visual images, um, that represent epic, epic in Arkansas. So for example, um, we have, um, a big picture of, um, the Buffalo river, and it says be epic. But let me back up one second. You know, when when um, when Steve Jobs rolled out Think Different, his marketing team actually wasn't completely on board with it. Um, hmm. They wanted to talk about features and functions, and he wanted to talk about different. And so the campaign, you know, one of the first uh, elements of the campaign was a. Um, painting uh, on the side of a building in Manhattan, Muhammad Ali standing there with gloves and it's different apple. Another one was a picture of Einstein on, a, it was, I think it was in New Jersey, a, a, a billboard and it showed Einstein. And it said, think different apple. So, you know, they were trying to convey values and culture of think different. Of course, it's had a huge impact on their product development more than, specific features or functions um so uh we did something so we have we have sure of you know epic people uh that have graduated from walton college um like doug mcmillan for example um and even our kansans that aren't uh uh alumni like maya angelou um, and many, many others. That's just a small part of the campaign. But we also make sure that the students are aware um, of this through many, many different um, mechanisms, including uh, classes that they, uh, their freshman year. You know, one kind of follow on question to, to all that is you've got these shared values you're obviously thinking a lot about the the tagline and uh and how all that informs what you do every day but sometimes corporate leaders large institutional leaders wonder how often should they revisit strategy so how often do you back to it and think we need to think about strategic planning again and and then once you do that how do you sort of reinforce any changes in strategy so that people get it and it's consistent with what you've said as values. So talk a little bit about the process that you go through. Sure. Well, we've changed the process over the years. I've been here 28 years, so 
seen a lot of strategic planning um, that's been done here. Sometimes it feels like we're always strategic planning, um, but we try to come up with a brand new strategic plan every five years. We didn't this last time because COVID, we were struggling to figure out what, how to survive and what to do uh, with COVID. And so we delayed our strategic planning process a little bit, but about every five years. And, and the previous, the strategic plan that I inherited was good, but it didn't really include a lot of strategy in my opinion. Let me explain that. Um, so for example, um, one of our uh, pillars of our strategic plan was to be outstanding teachers, right? And we had uh, another one, be outstanding researchers. I'm not saying it exactly the way we're, that's the, the notion. To me, that's not strategy. Um, those are hygiene elements, right? Uh, they say the way you can tell if you have a strategy versus a hygiene um, is look at the opposite. And if the opposite is ridiculous, you probably don't have a strategy. So, for example, we're a college of business. Uh, would it make sense for us to not be outstanding teachers or to not be outstanding researchers? Of course not. Mm. And that is an indication that we're, what we're actually talking about there is a, a hygiene, not, not a strategy. Now, I'm not saying our strategic plan didn't have strategy in it. I think it did. Because um, if you look, we had specific initiatives to achieve uh, uh, greatness in um, seven of these pillars. I'm not going through all of them right now, but there seven of them, in my opinion, were uh, pretty much, um, you know, hygiene elements. And so uh, right now we are in the midst of a, a strategic planning process getting towards the end of it. We, we started actually some during the pandemic. Um, and one of the things that we did early on um, in the strategic planning process was we did a lot of sense making. And sense making is when you look at the environment around you and say, what does this mean? And what does this mean for us? So we, um, you know, we looked at things like trends in demographics uh, for graduating high school students, trends in terms of what companies are looking for um, in um, alumni and students, and all kinds of trends. We looked at lots of trends. We said, uh, as a leadership team, we said, what do these trends mean? for us what decisions do we have to make as a result of these trends um so um we did that we um we also got a lot of other people involved across but then it really slowed us down on that and we restarted and um we've used lots of uh, interviews and discussions with groups within the college. And uh, so, so to answer your question, about every five years, we want to come up with a new strategic plan. Um, two, we, um, we want to make sure that uh, there is procedural justice involved in any strategic plan that we create. And, and procedural justice, I don't mean that in the legal sense, but in the organization, and that is people feel like they had a voice in it. Did they have a voice in it? Uh, you know, when you're creating strategy, of course, you want to make sure that your strategies align with your, your values and your, your vision and mission really clearly. But you also want to make sure that everyone's been heard. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that every idea that comes out of every mouth is, is, um, is incorporated. But there needs to be an attempt to incorporate and or rethink things, even if it takes a long time, a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, you know, that's key for getting buy-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ultimately, so, you want uh, people to internalize it as well. I mean, that, yeah. that process of 
of making that part of the process means they're going to internalize it and it will inform what we do every day rather than it being something that's kind of thrust upon them from upon high. That, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and so we're we're still in the process of, of doing that. We've come out with five strategies that we're, we're not ready to go public with because we're not sure, especially one of them um, is, is a question. But for this last group of, of strategies, we went to, we, we interviewed um, lots of faculty and staff and students. And one thing we asked is for this, this group of five, is there any you would throw out? And there was one that a lot of people, you know, you could tell they were hesitating with, but, but the bottom line was no one felt any of the five should be thrown out. And that's a, that's huge to get to that point. Uh, actually, I've not seen that happen quite like that before. Uh, it makes me think that uh, they probably are good strategies um, at this point. Um, but then once you get the strategies in place, you know, you've got to make sure that you're allocating resources to achieve those. And um, one, one thing I, I should mention that you all may not, may not know um, is one thing that is also affecting our strategy in real time may require us to make a few changes to what we're planning on doing is our growth. So just to give you an idea, two years ago, the incoming freshman class was 1,400 students, which was huge. Um, this past the incoming freshman cohort was 1,900. Hmm. Wow. That was a big increase. That is. Based on housing, con housing contracts and ad ad admits, it's looking like um, four hundred freshmen, in college, which will represent about a third of all freshmen coming into the University of Arkansas. So we had, we're going to have about a thousand more freshmen this year than we had last year at the university, and eight hundred of them. Um, about are in the Walton College, not not exactly 800. And and some is a little bit up in the air now, but I am pretty confident we'll have 2,400 students um, in the fall based on history and patterns that we've seen. This kind of growth is very difficult to deal with, and it exposed issues. And from a from an entrepreneurship perspective, it's kind of like we're in the scaling phase. Mm -hmm. Right. We are scaling right now. There's no question about it. Um, in 2015, when I became dean, we had around 5,000 students. Right now, we've got about 7,100. And we were forecasting that it would take about 10 years to get to 10,000 from last year. And now we're forecasting about four to five years to get to uh, 10,000 students in the business school. And that kind of growth reveals problems and business processes. And a lot of times people say, well, growth isn't good because it causes problems. But the reality is those problems existed before the growth did. Mm -hmm. And so the growth is good because it uncovers where there are problems. And then we can address those problems and improve the process, regardless of whether or not we continue to grow. You know, you bring up an interesting point, um, and one thing I'd like to get your perspective on is this enrollment cliff that I know a lot of uh, universities in general are beginning to think about. 2026, they're expecting a, an enrollment cliff of of 18 year olds entering college to drop off, you know, considerably. Yet you're planning. Uh, uh, significant scaling growth through that period. So can you talk a little bit about that and your perspective on that? Yeah. Well, the, the, the enrollment cliffs already hit. Um, if you look at enrollment at most universities in um, our region, you see, you see a decrease. Um, 
the, the numbers I've seen, we've, I mean, you see it in the newspaper. Um, but if you look at, uh, if you look at um, the United States, I mean, this year alone, we will have a f- one million fewer students at university. So the enrollment cliff started um, actually a few years ago. If you look at enrollment in uh, for in um, college in the state of Arkansas, for example, it clearly already started hitting. Um, and some Texas is one of the few states that I think uh, maybe it's Texas and Utah that don't have that enrollment cliff coming. Um, and we, of course, get a lot of students from Texas. Um, and one good thing for Arkansas about all the students we're importing from Texas and other states, I mean, we've got a lot of students coming from Missouri, Illinois, um, you know, all over uh, the country, really, um, is that a certain percentage of them stay. And Arkansas, one of the biggest um, impediments to economic growth in Arkansas is going to be managerial and leadership talent. So um, we feel like we're contributing in that way. So how have we, why are we growing uh, when higher ed is not growing in general? Um, and why do we think it will continue? We're, we do lots of things around, uh, we've got the innovative programs um, for one thing. Um, and they, we keep adding innovative programs. We're getting students more engaged in those programs. But we also answer questions. For example, you know, when students are going to college, a real common question they have is, how do I apply for scholarships? How do I get into housing? We have um, created short blogs on the Walton College website, uh, Walton Insights, it's called. Um, for example, one of them is titled, How Do You Apply for Scholarships in the Walton College? It's laid out. It has a very clear on how to do it. And um, we also have things like, you know, how do you choose a major in business? We've got a blog on that. Uh, what do you learn if you major in economics? Uh, on and on and on. We, we kind of look for, what problems and questions do parents and students have when they're trying to pick a school? And then we answer it in the shortest, easiest, most accessible way possible. It sounds kind of silly, uh, but you would, you, uh, if you look at the traffic on the Walton College website and compare it to other business schools in the SEC or in, in, the, in the US, really, we have had a sharp increase uh, in traffic since August of 2017. Of course, we started at the bottom, so <laughs> that was. Uh, but but we've actually per- paid up uh, many. Uh, if you look at like the number of keywords we rank for on uh, Google, a uh, Google search, you know, in August of 17, we were at about 1,500. Uh, now we're at about 80,000. Um, and our web traffic, even last month, our web traffic had a sharp. Uh, increase. And again, the, it's not that we, the, the key metric isn't uh, web traffic. The key metric is how well we're addressing questions people have and how engaged do we get students and prepare them for a career. We, we've put much effort into this um, over the past few years. In fact, some of you know Kim Boss, she's senior assistant dean. She has the new title years ago we gave her a title called chief student officer mm-hmm. so she looks at everything from you know orientation to placement and um, I realized that our business processes weren't working properly in that way we were very siloed right the career center was very separate from advising which was very, so all these things were in their own little silos. And Karen has brought, um, uh, she's put in a process that links them all. And, um, and we get students, all students have to take something called freshman business connections. 
um, their first semester of their freshman year where they think about why am I here? Why am I getting a degree? What do I want my resume to look like in four years when I graduate? Um, and that can, of course, evolve. We've got, we've got online tools that help students keep track of everything they're doing. They, they create an electronic log, if you will. Because you know, the time you graduate and you say your junior year, when you go uh, of the junior year um, before the senior year, a lot of times um, people will, students will start putting together their resumes and they don't remember all the interesting projects they've worked on and um, internships and guest speakers they've met and on and on. This is now in their log. They've got, they've got a record of this now from the very beginning. And it helps them, you know, if you, if you kind of know where you want to go, and you, you, you start making progress towards it. You pivot a little bit as you go. But where you want to go can shift, too, while you're here. When you're 17 years old, it's hard to know what you want to do. Um, but yeah. as, you, as you start maturing, you, you get a better idea. Well, let's talk about Wall Street's book, Dean's List, Leading a Business School. Tell us a little bit about what the readers will learn from uh, – from your experiences in, 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 as represented in that book? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, so the, the Dean's list is, uh, by the way, um, all of the books I've published over the past few years, I don't, I don't get any royalties from them. Um, I give the, the royalties, uh, the ones that are published through the university have gone to the the university, the others have gone to other organizations, but, um, but the Dean's list. So when I became Dean in 2015, I thought I've been a professor for a long time. I've been a department chair. I've been an associate Dean. Uh, you know, I ran our EMBA program in China for a couple of years and I don't know how to be a Dean. Hmm. I really don't know. And so I started calling Deans around the tree that real successful business school deans and asking them what I should be doing to be a, a good dean. And I started taking lots of notes. And then I started experimenting. I mean, we've got, you know, about 150 full-time faculty. We've got lots of adjuncts and lecturers and over 100 staff and then 7,000 students. And I thought, I should take best practices that we teach in the business school, whether they be in marketing, operations, you know, um, st strategy, et cetera, and experimenting with them as I lead, even leadership uh, theories and concepts. And so I started doing that, and I would monitor what I thought worked and what I thought didn't. And um, eventually I thought, I should turn this into a book. Well, before I thought I should turn it into a book, I thought, well, I should turn this into a um manual so that the um, team that comes after me could, you know, have a, a game plan. They, they wouldn't have to do exactly what I did, but it might help them get up to speed. And, but then I realized this, there's a lot of people out there uh, that would need this. There's a few thousand, thousands of business schools around the world. And so there's lots of deans. Um, and so, um, and so I, I wrote the book, but um, I'll tell you, when you write about what you're doing, it helps you be more strategic. And there's mm -hmm. one other, there's other leaders who have done this. Um, one is um, Charles Morgan. He's done a lot mm -hmm. of writing internally and even of, of books. And he really believes that it helped him be more strategic and intentional. Mm -hmm in his leadership. When you're writing a book, for example, as I was writing the Dean's List, I would get to points where I was reading and think, well, I'd like to see this turn out this way, <laughs> you know, before I publish mm -hmm. this book. So it took me a long time to publish the book because I actually wanted to accomplish some things to be in the book. Mm. Um, and, and so it made me uh, more strategic, I think, in that way. I won't. I mean, Very, this is not going to be a bestseller by any means. The 
The market's very small uh, for this book. Well, bestseller versus impactful, right? When I mean, we're looking for impactful, and I can, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to to read it myself. I hadn't had a chance to do that yet, but not even being a business dean, I'm very involved with with uh, higher education and and look forward to uh, to to learning from it. We're talking with Matt Waller, dean of the Walton College of Business at the University of Arkansas. Uh, dean Waller, great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Appreciate all you do. Absolutely, you're you're a uh, you're an epic force in the uh, in the business world in the state of Arkansas, and we appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate what you two are doing to drive innovation, entrepreneurship in Arkansas. So thank you as well. Absolutely. Yes, sir. This has been another episode of the Innovation Junkies podcast. Thank you for joining. See you next time. Feedback from listeners like you helps us create outstanding content. So if you like this episode, be sure to rate us or leave a review. Also, don't forget to subscribe to get the latest growth and innovation strategies. Thanks for tuning in to the Innovation Junkies podcast.